department is uh, the leader in the country in terms of uh, research grants and uh, really doing seminal work in DNA repair and uh, radiation sensitizing research. So uh, I think we're going to have really two great presentations today. I'd first like to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Glazer, who is the Robert E. Hunter Professor of Therapeutic Radiology and Professor of Genetics. He's also the Chair of the Department of Therapeutic Radiology at the Yale School of Medicine. And today he will speak to us about minimally invasive gene editing by some kind of nanoparticles, which he will explain to us. Peter. Uh, thanks, Howard, and, th and thank uh, Renee for the invitation to speak today. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, gene editing, uh, which obviously is in the news, and uh, you can't pick up um, a newspaper or turn on the Today Show and you, you hear about CRISPR. So I, I'm going to present a little bit different take on things. It's not exactly a focus on cancer, but this particular talk is focused on hematology, benign hematology, which is still uh, sort of associated with the Cancer Center, so I'm taking a little bit of a liberty there. But uh, some of what we're doing has uh, application to cancer, which I'll talk about uh, just briefly at the end. So I had the uh, title of minimally evasive gene editing as, as kind of a, a generic title, but um, I thought about using this one that was in BioWorld today after we had our recent publication of Move Over CRISPR. Uh, I think that might be a little presumptuous, but the point is that um, we've developed, or we've been developing an alternative method for gene editing that may have some advantages. And one of them is uh, captured here that we were able to, uh, I'm going to tell you the story of we were able to achieve uh, intravenously administered uh, nanoparticles uh, to mediate uh, gene editing to cure a thalassemia in a mouse model. And the whole point of this is that. Um, we're working towards something that will be simple. I'm not sure it'll be cheap, but it'll be simple and potentially much easier to administer uh, because um, as much of the excitement that's been going on with CRISPR, uh, it has not been achieved in a whole animal with systemic administration to edit uh, anything by CRISPR in the way that I'm going to tell you about uh, we've been able to do that. So I have uh, some disclosures, um, just that I have some uh, uh, stock options and two biotech companies. Uh, unfortunately, not worth anything right now. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm sure everybody in the audience is familiar with approaches for, for gene editing, um, most notably CRISPR-Cas9. But the whole point is that um, the, starting with uh, earlier approaches to make engineered nucleases that create a double-strand break at a target site with zinc finger uh, recognition, of uh, DNA sequences linked to a restriction enzyme, uh, meganucleases derived from uh, yeast, or uh, talons, which is another type of DNA recognition motif linked to the FOC1 restriction enzyme, and um, more recently, uh, development of, or, or, or uh, sort of engineering of the CRISPR-Cas9 system to be so easy to use. So we've been working on an alternative strategy for a number of years, and that's diagrammed here in this structure. So this is the DNA double helix everyone is familiar with, and this red, red strand that fits in the major groove of the duplex is uh, forming a triple helix. And the important point of this is that this can form in a sequence-dependent way. So you can develop uh, oligonucleotides that will bind to the duplex DNA in a site-specific manner. And what we discovered was that the formation of this altered helix triggers a DNA repair reaction, and that this can be exploited also for gene editing, and that's really the basis of that. So that's the connection to DNA repair and radiobiology, that the triplex formation triggers DNA repair. So what's the big deal with strand breaks? So it turns out that um, it, you know, work from uh, 20 to 30 years ago, uh, when people were trying to mimic what you could do in yeast, you know, in yeast you can introduce a piece of DNA and it integrates in its cognate site most of the time, and that's why people, for example, like my wife Susan Bezerga, who's worked on yeast for many years, can make uh, outstanding headway in, in, in sorting out biochemical processes because you can do gene editing in yeast, and you could do it way before uh, CRISPR was born. but. Uh, in, in mammalian cells, when you introduce a piece of DNA, it goes into the homologous site at a frequency of one in a million. That's why in 2007, Kopecky, Evans, and Smithies won the Nobel Prize for their technique to select for the correct integration. It doesn't increase the frequency, but they had the double 
uh, selection with NEO and TK or HPRT that you could select for integration and then select against the wrong integration site. And that's the, that was the mechanism for making knockout mice for many years until CRISPR came along. But, but Maria Jason, John Wilson, Dana Carroll, and others showed that if you can make a double strand break or a strand break at the target site, you can change this ratio uh, uh, from one in a thousand to you know, close to you know, one to one. Basically, it vastly improves the probability that it will go in, the in, in introduced piece of DNA will go into its target site if you make a strand break there. So that's when the race was on to develop targeted nucleases that we've talked about. And then about 20 years ago, we showed that the DNA triple helix formation stimulates repair and then secondarily induces strand breaks. So in a way, it's a form of a chemical CRISPR, if you will. But the problem is it wasn't that potent. Um, and even though it got some attention, the potency, you know, the frequency was one in 10,000 uh, type of thing. And it wasn't really uh, viable as a research tool or as a therapeutic strategy. But over the past 20 years, we've tested more than uh, 50 DNA modifications and analogs to see if we could improve this process. And so we, we centered on, um, more, most recently, peptidocleic acid. So, so they're diagrammed here. So this is a protein backbone. This is the PNA backbone with the polyamide linkages, but it has the nucleobases here. And it turns out that, uh, fortuitously, this lines up with DNA here, which is in the phosphodiester backbone perfectly. And PNA-DNA binding is much stronger than DNA-DNA binding. So the PNAs have some advantage. Uh, one of the key features is these are not charged, so there's no charge repulsion between phosphodiester um, uh, uh, negative charges. So it turns out the PNA is so good at binding, it can do two things. It can bind by Watson-Crick, as shown here, and displace one of the DNA strands, and then it can bind as a triple helix here. So you can have a PNA, DNA, PNA, triple helix with a displaced DNA strand. And this, this structure strongly provokes DNA repair. Uh, and then if you want to um, play with it a little bit more, here's the DNA target, here's a, a Watson-Crick PNA binding, and then here is the triple helix PNA, and the the J uh, shown here is just a cytosine analog in the PNA backbone. Um, and then it turns out that triple helix formation is favored at runs of DNA that have all purines. So that's why you see here the, um, the purine run. But then you can extend the Watson-Crick uh, domain to create more specificity. And we call this a tail. So this is the tail and then the clamp. And it forms a PNA, DNA, PNA, triple helix and called the tail clamp PNA. And that's the molecule that we, after about 15 years of, of empirical studies, uh, we uh, settled on. And so the idea is that, that the PNA will form, form this triplex, it'll displace the strand, and it'll trigger a repair reaction. And if you come in with a piece of DNA homologous to the target site, except for a nucleotide you want to change, you can mediate a gene editing event. So. Um, then uh, it turns out PNAs are good, but you can improve on them. And so this is the PNA monomer with the nucleobase here. But standard PNAs, they have no charge and they're quite hydrophobic, so they, they kind of form a blob in aqueous solution and solubility is an issue. So we got together with uh, Danith Lee at Carnegie Mellon and he had developed a modification of PNA at the, at the gamma position. I'm sorry, for some reason these didn't come through. It should be alpha, beta, gamma. There's a side chain here. It's two ethylene glycol molecules mini, called mini-peg. And this, for, this is a chiral center that forces the PNA oligomer into a right-handed helix. Well, what does this mean? First of all, circular dichroism shows that that molecule is already helical in solution. It's not a blob like regular PNA. But more importantly, here's a melting curve for DNA against DNA, PNA against DNA, and then gamma PNA against DNA, and look, it's melting at about 80 to 90 degrees. So that's telling you, you basically have to boil these things off. So it's a super good binder to DNA. And this made all the difference. So uh, now I'm gonna tell you about uh, our application. And so uh, you're all familiar with beta thalassemia. Uh, it's a, a disease, a disorder of um, insufficient uh, beta globin production. And uh, we, we started with um, a mouse model in which the human beta globin intron 
with a splicing mutation associated with thalassemia is integrated in the middle of GFP. So if you correct the mutation, you get green. And it's the same process. You have the PNA bind, it triggers a repair reaction, and uh, then you correct the mutation, you could get a green cell. So um, we designed some PNAs to target this region. And unlike CRISPR, where you can just basically dial in your guide RNA, this, there's, there's some empirical testing uh, of some of the sequences. So it's, it's not exactly ready for general use, but you can develop specific molecules for, uh, molecules for specific genes after some experimentation. And we showed that these bind by gel shift. Um, and then, uh, importantly, we got together with the uh, lab of Mark Saltzman um, across campus uh, and he's an expert in drug delivery, including, including nucleic acids, and he's developed polymer nanoparticles made out of this substance, PLGA, which some of you know is used to encapsulate Lupron for, for depot injections for prostate cancer. So this is already an FDA-approved compound, and you can formulate the nucleic acids into these little uh, two to 300 nanometer balls of um, basically a polymer, like a starch. So we tested some of those. Uh, PNAs that I showed you combined with um, the donor DNAs. We got bone marrow from the mice. We treated the bone marrow cells ex vivo in a dish, and then we looked at evidence of editing by green cells, and we found one of the PNAs was better than the others, and we proceeded to follow up with that PNA. But now we decorated it with the gamma monomer, as you see here in blue, uh, to see if we could make a, a better um, reagent, and this is just a scrambled sequence control. And uh, what we found is, in fact, uh, we do make a better reagent. This is the regular PNA, and this is the gamma. And this is a single treatment of bone marrow cells. Now, what I'll say, point out here is um, uh, Nicole McNear and Ramon Bahal in the lab had the idea to sort these cells for different markers, and it turns out CD117 is important. The CD117 cells, which is the C-kit protein, show remarkable gene editing in a single treatment. 7.5% of the cells were edited. Um, and if you pre-sort those cells and then treat them, uh, so the other way around, you, before we treated and then sorted, now we're sorting and treating, you get a similar result. Um, and um, then we said, well, if the C-kit protein is playing a role, let's stimulate it with stem cell factor. That's its ligand. And in fact, now in a single treatment, you get about 14% gene editing. Uh, the converse is if you use CKIT pathway inhibitors like the satinib, you inhibit the editing process. So what's going on? It turns out the CD117 cells, if you sort them and then you just do RNA-seq, uh, you can see that they uh, express higher levels of uh, DNA repair factors as shown here in red. And then if you further stimulate them with stem cell factor, it goes up even more. So basically these uh, cells, uh, kit positive cells, which mark stem cells, are really good at DNA repair and therefore really good at, at being susceptible to gene editing. Okay, now we moved on to the mouse model. So we, uh, this is actually was made by Oliver Smithies, uh, and uh, he used his technique of knocking in and selecting in, uh, embryonic stem cells, and he made a mouse model in which the b mouse beta major and minor alleles are knocked out and replaced by the human gene beta globin gene with a naturally occurring mutation, the same one that we modeled in the other mice. And so these mice are thalassemic, as you see here. So they have the human beta globin gene with a thalassemia mutation. So what, what uh, Raman in the lab did is he took these cell mice and he uh, did a variety of treatments, mock or with uh, the, na the nanoparticles, uh, I think four milligrams of nanoparticles given uh, every two days for four treatments. And, uh, and then versus the scrambled. Um, oh no, that's blank. We have scrambled on the next slide. And then we, we waited up to 20 weeks and we harvested uh, for analysis, but we also did blood sampling and other things along the way. So this is uh, one of our key results and this is what we see in the mice. The, the blank treated or the ones treated with the scrambled sequence molecule, the hemoglobin levels remain below the normal range. But the ones we treated within 30 days, the hemoglobin levels are increased to normal. And they stay normal for uh, up to 140 days. And I'd just like to point out, when we first sent the paper, we had this taken out 75 days. And um, uh, the reviewer said, oh, that's not quite good enough. We need it longer. 
Now, of course, at this point, no CRISPR paper had ever done in vivo gene editing, but we had to go back and do the whole thing again, and we had to wait to 140 days and then send the paper back, okay? So, um, and what we found, if we also looked at reticulocytes, that these animals have a high reticulocyte count because they have revved up hematopoiesis, but when we treated them, uh, within 36 days, the reticulocyte count went back to normal. And uh, this is a nice demonstration also of uh, amelioration of the disease. This is a normal mouse spleen. The thalassemic mice have huge spleens because they have extra medullary hematopoiesis. Uh, and then if you have um, the scrambled molecules don't improve anything, but uh, treated with our targeting PNAs in the nanoparticles, uh, we get a substantial reversal of the splenomegaly. And uh, in, in uh, working with Demetrius Braddock in pathology, uh, uh, who helped us a lot on this, we saw that um, these are wild type mice, uh, mouse uh, spleen histology uh, sections. And uh, this is the uh, control animal, uh, the animals with blank nanoparticles. You can see a disordered architecture. But uh, the treated mice, uh, within uh, 36 days, the splenic architecture is restored in conjunction with reversal of the splenomegaly. If you, if you actually quantify the, the gene editing by deep sequencing, about 4% of the total bone marrow was edited. Uh, and actually, uh, one of the reviewers made us go back and do it again and sort for stem cells. We did this in conjunction with Diane Krauss and Pat Gallagher. Uh, this, this was not an easy experiment because you don't get a lot of cells from uh, the treated mice, uh, the bone marrow, to do the sorting and then do sequencing. Uh, but it was a heroic effort, and we were able to show actually what most people consider to be the metabolic stem cell. Uh, these guys were actually uh, edited at a little higher frequency, consistent with the stem cells being more susceptible to gene editing. Um, and then we went on, and uh, they also wanted us to do human cells, so we got human CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells from Diane's repository. We treated those uh, in culture and got about almost 5% editing. And then we actually took the treated cells and engrafted them into nod skid mice that were irradiated to eliminate their own hematopoietic system. And we showed that uh, the edited cells could still engraft, and we could detect evidence of gene editing in the human cells transplanted in the mice, um, I think about uh, eight weeks later. OK, now what about specificity? Because this is a big issue for, for um, targeted nucleases, uh, as you know. Um, so uh, one thing we did, and this was at the request of one of the reviewers, is uh, we looked at uh, something called H2AX foci. So gamma H2AX is a modification of a histone component that marks DNA double strand breaks, and it can be detected in foci by immune fluorescence. So what you see here is untreated cells. You usually have one or two foci. That's, that's typical. This is just lipofectamine, which is something we use for transfecting CRISPR-Cas9 blank nanoparticles, and our targeting nanoparticles with the PNA and the DNA, there's nothing visible above background. And I'll show you the graphs on the next slide. And I want to take you down to this one in the lower right. This is if you give uh, five grades of radiation. So um, uh, I, everyone knows that radiation causes lots of double strand breaks. And here you see the gamma H2X foci marking them. Well, here's what happens if you just transfect Cas9 into cells and you get plenty of double strand breaks. Now, if you add the guide RNA, it reduces that by a lot, but it's still above background. So the reviewer asked us to do this, and then when we did it, he said, something must be wrong with this. <laughs> so um, so I, I ended up talking to two people that do a lot with CRISPR. One was Eric Sondheimer at UMass, and he said, well, in fact, there's emerging evidence that Cas9 will cut at RNA-DNA hybrids uh, aside from uh, what uh, the, the guide RNA mediates. And that's going to be coming out soon. And then I, I talked to Jennifer Dowden about this. And she, she didn't have an explanation, but she wanted me to try a, a Cas9 in which the nuclease activity was mutated, uh, with the implication that maybe it's, it's, a, it's an off-target effect of Cas9. But either way, it's an effect of Cas9. We don't have that result yet. But the point is, um, the reviewer wanted us to take this out of the ultimate publication, but the editor let us keep it in. So that just tells you. <laughs> so here's the quantification. This is, this is radiation. This is Cas9 by itself, double strand breaks. 
And then if you add the guide RNA, you're doing pretty good, but you're not back to background. Now, of course, you could play with the stoichiometry, but the point is that's what we got. Okay, if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at off-target effects by sequencing the seven or eight other sites in the genome most closely homologous, uh, here's the frequency of editing in the beta globin in the mice. Um, and um, I can't really read from here, but so that's about 4%. So you can see in most of these other uh, sites, we've, we've got almost no uh, modification. For some reason, this one in the olfactory receptor, we saw a, a number of uh, changes. And I don't have an explanation for that, but that's what we got. Uh, but then when we did the same thing in human cells, uh, we got about 5% gene editing, but when we looked at all these other loci, it, it was about 100,000-fold less frequent. Uh, and I think these numbers are probably um, a thousand-fold better than what you get with zinc finger nucleases or CRISPR. Uh, we also looked at inflammatory cytokines, and you basically don't see any induction of the usual cytokine panel. So um, this is the publication, and I just put this up here to, to uh, recognize a, a host of Yale faculty and, and postdocs and students. Uh, I mentioned some of the uh, people, Diane, Pretty Kumar, Pat, Demetrius, and Mark, uh, who we, we could not have done this without their help. I also want to point out that this paper was submitted in September of 15 and accepted in uh, uh, September of 16. So this paper took 12 months. And uh, if you look at the same um, uh, information for the typical CRISPR paper in one of the Nature journals, it's usually accepted in about 12 minutes. Um, <laughs> So th this didn't get that much attention until this article came out. So, you know, my son, uh, he kind of vaguely knows what, we're, what, I, what I do. And sometimes he hears Susan and I talk at the dinner table, but he really doesn't care much and pay attention. But all of a sudden, he sent me a text, oh, my God, Dad, your, your name was mentioned in an article with J-Lo, <laughs> OK? Because someone had sent him this. So it turns out the Washington Post interviewed me, and we spent like an hour on the phone, and, and he really asked a lot of good questions. I thought it was going to be a really serious article, but it turned out he started the whole thing with the fact that J-Lo is developing a TV series about a mad scientist that wants to engineer uh, a perfect human with CRISPR. Uh, and so at the very end, he mentioned something about our research. But, um, but then he actually asked me, he said, how come it took a year to get published? You know, I said, can we off the record? And I told him a little bit about the reviewers. And then I said to him, um, well, you know, the CRISPR guys, they wake up in the morning, do one experiment, and then they send it to nature. And, and he said, oh, my god, I've, can I quote you on that? I said, we're off the record. I said, you cannot put that in anything, or I'll be dead. So, um, but he loved that quote. Um, so what's next? So. Um, we're actually applying this now to sickle cell disease, working with Pat and uh, Gallagher and others, uh, and we have some preliminary data. We've actually done some work with cystic fibrosis, and actually Marie Egan gave a talk yesterday afternoon on some of this, an excellent talk, and we, we have some progress in a sickle cell, I mean a cystic fibrosis mouse model. And uh, with Pat, we're doing some work in hereditary uh, spherocytosis that uh, is promising. Um, so what about cancers? So in fact, we've used some of this PNA technology not as triplex but as antisense, and actually in collaboration with uh, Frank Slack, who recently was here now at Boston, Mark Saltzman and Don Engelman, and again Demetrius, uh, we um, showed that PNAs can be targeted to the tumor microenvironment to silence microRNAs, and so we're building on this now to include that new gamma PNA technology. And the question is, is gene editing for cancer a, a viable strategy? I'm not sure we're at a frequency that we could achieve meaningful effect on a, on a tumor, but the, in theory, you could try to edit oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. And another thing we're interested in is, could we edit immune checkpoint regulators? Uh, and that's something that we're um, thinking about. So I have mentioned a lot of the people that did the work. Uh, and I'll just highlight uh, that Ramon did about 90% of what I showed you with some help from Nicole and Elias did a lot of work. And I've been lucky to share uh, several uh, really good uh, MD-PhD students with, with Mark and uh, other members of the lab. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you.
you, Peter. That, that was, was really exciting. I mean, to think that we may actually see real DNA therapy in our day is like amazing. And uh, congratulations on this seminal Thanks. work. So, questions from anybody? 